I like to make post-experiment figures to make it faster to figure out what the heck I did when I do was doing an experiment or I'm looking back in the future and to make it easier to show others what I found. And so I want to show you how you can make these two. I uh, use Adobe Illustrator. A free alternative is Inkscape. Um, but I'm going to show you some tips for getting around in Illustrator and making these figures. So what these two have in common is that they're vector graphics software. Um, so basically, instead of having pixelated images, they have instructions for telling the computer how to recreate the image. So this makes them so that you can blow them up as big as you want without getting all pixelated. Um, so if you like save your files as a PDF um, with this software, then you can then export them in this way that you can then, if you have to give a presentation or say, you can put it up on a big slide presenter and it's not gonna look at all pixelated. Um, and it's also editable. So you might not know this, but sometimes if you have like a PDF file, you can open it in Illustrator or Inkscape and actually be able to, if it was saved in the vector format, then you'll be able to manipulate the individual items. And so this can be really helpful too. So Inkscape is a free alternative. Um, I've used it in the past, but I have an Illustrator now and I'm gonna show you how I do it on Illustrator. So I really, really highly recommend that you start, get at least familiar with the basics of one of these softwares. It doesn't have to be Illustrator, it can be Inkscape or something. It's a really important skill to have as a scientist. Um, it helps you make things that easily make things that are going to look professional um, and that you can present and do all these things. And it's a lot easier to kind of learn it in the beginning and then keep building upon it rather than having to, like you need to make a figure for a paper and all of a sudden like, I don't know how to use Illustrator. Um, so I have more in-depth posts on Illustrator, but today I wanted to talk to you about like this figure making and then like, how you can export these figures and stuff. So basically I want to make sure that I have all the information I need about my experiments when I need to go find what I did. Um, so I there's been a lot of times where basically you know that you did this experiment once, but you don't remember what the conditions were or that sort of thing. And so by keeping them all in one place, then you can easily look up the figure and have all the information you need about the reaction conditions there and the reaction, the date, so that you can then cross-reference back to your notes for more expensive things, but that you have this way that you can see it all at once. And so how I basically lay these out is that I make these figures along the way when I'm doing experiments. And so this way I don't have to rush at the end if I need to then present this or um, show it to my boss or present it in a meeting or that sort of thing. So if I make these along the way, then I don't have to worry about that the last minute. And I actually keep, so I keep a big, um, Illustrator file with all of the figures for all my experiments. And then I have a page, I export them as PDFs. And then I have, I keep a OneNote electronic notebook and I have a page where I have all of the PDFs from the experiments. We'll have them um, different tabs for different types of experiments. But that way I can then easily find the different experiments. And because it's in my notebook as well, I can then cross reference to the date. So the date is one of the most important things that I put on these figures. Um, so here is an example of a fake experiment. Um, and so basically here is like the experiment um, date so that I can cross reference. And this is just slot plot numbers. This is an example that I did based on a slot plot, um, which is a binding assay. So you're trying to increase the concentration of one thing, in this case stickers, um, and then seeing the proportion that's found. Um, so a lot of times for these types of experiments, we'll want to present the data in different ways. And so I make the figures so that I can crop out the data, the, the format that I want to show in the format, in the presentation or whatever. So often you wouldn't want to show a table um, like this in some sort of presentation where you would be showing some like a big, you want to show like a big table or something that people have to read when you're giving a presentation where you want to keep text to a minimum. And so you can crop out that, as well as crop out all these experimental details that you don't want to then keep in the, keep in the, um, in your slide or whatever that people would then see. So 
and but you might want the title and so you can, I typically put a title on top that is something that is keep inable um, or take outable depending on what I want to do. So you just have to be strategic about where you place your crop lines and so you'll have different types of things for different types of experiments but you can do so in a way where you can easily crop them out. And then, of course, you need to save them. Um, and so basically in Illustrator, each of these white things, this is an artboard. And so if you go to this tool over here, this is the artboard. And so you can see you can title your artboards. Um, and so if you put the like, so I could put like 09, I put the date and then the experiment. And then this will then save this as the default name. If I want to export it, I can export it um, for like screens and then I can export it as the artboards. This is good if the artboard is the size that you want it, um, but sometimes the size isn't what you want. And so when it isn't what you want, that you have a couple options. Um, so basically you can use this artboard tool, you can then just crop it to what you want. Or what you can do is if you want to fit it directly to it, you can select everything and then object artboards fit to selected art, um, and then it will crop around it. The other option, so you can export it like this as the artboard, or you can use this export asset as the export panel or whatever. Um, and so basically what, if you click on something, if it's a group, um, then you can drag it over and it'll stay as a group. Um, and then you can name this asset and then you could export it in different ways. Um, so you can, um, the good thing about PDFs is that you have the option to then um, blow them up and stuff, but they can be big file sizes. And so you can also export it in smaller files. Um, so if things are already grouped, so here are the groups, what command you use for group, um, you can do shift command group to ungroup. So if I ungroup these, I can then individually export these as separate assets. If there are ungrouped, but I want to export this whole thing as a single file, what you can do is you can actually um, select them all and then use option and drag and then it'll be something here and then you just name it here. Um, note that if you change something in here, this will change. And if something you change something in here though that wasn't in there, then like if I make a change to this, it'll then like if I add something new, then if it's not in part of the group, then it's not going to show up here. So just be careful about that and relink when you need to. Speaking of relinking, um, so a lot of times you might have like images that you want to put in. And so remember the images, these will get pixelated if you get really big, whereas the other stuff is not. And so basically though, with images, so like a lot of times you have gels or that sort of thing, and it's really helpful if you clearly label your gels and so you know what's what. Um, it can also go get tedious if you were to try to do this like every time for the exact same thing. And so using Illustrator, you can then basically have, say, you can write out your ladder ahead of time and then use the same, just copy and paste it and use it for different things. So you often don't want to show the entire gel, um, at least in your main figure. You might have to in like a supplemental or whatever. So you'll want to keep the keep it linked to the gel, um, but only show a certain part of it, if it's like a Western blot or something like that. Um, in this case, it's a phosphostain gel. And it's important that you can like link files. So this image is here, but it's masked. Um, and so basically, instead of, if you crop image, it's actually gonna like cut the image. But if you just mask it, it's going to keep the image, but you can crop out the area that you want, but you're keeping the, the whole photo there. And so then you can have that um, reference to do your like supplemental or whatever that you need and just have all the information um, stored together. So you're not doing anything, um, accidentally mixing up your gels or anything like that. Speaking of which, you can you can link your files. So basically, you can then relink the files. And so basically, if you change the original file, but you keep the same name, then this will automatically update. If you change, you can also change the file um, to do something different. And this is really helpful if you have, say, multiple gels that were all 
have similar layout or that sort of thing, you can then change the file and then just change any of the text that you need to change. Um, so the so you want to do the image mask and then you can also like be careful when you're like changing the mass versus changing the image when you're trying to move things around. You have to make sure you have the presets so that you can set Adobe Illustrator to like autosave, but if you don't, if you have it under like default conditions or whatever, it's not going to autosave the linked pictures. And so I like to, it, it's more like energy intestine or whatever. So you can actually change the settings though, so that it does um, save the figures. And that way, if you have, I've noticed a lot of times if my computer crashes or Illustrator crashes, and then it uses the auto save that the figures, the, fig, the connected figures will be missing. But you can set it so that when you save it, you actually have it include the linked files as well so that anybody can open it. And you can open it later, even if you um, don't have that file anymore for some reason. Another important thing is shift. Um, when you're like dragging, if you do shift, sorry. So say if you have some shape, if you shift it, now it's not going to change the dimensions. But if you just um, do it like normal, then it can, you can be altering the dimensions. And if you, often you don't want that. Um, especially if you are changing, like you want to change the whole size of this so that you can shift and drag as opposed to just like being dragging it and warping it, which is you often see um, people accidentally warp their figures and stuff um, when they're trying to fit it onto something. Another thing is, so this text, um, this is the, so if you go to t press T, you get text. Um, so this is text is different modes. So this is like this blue mode. Basically here, it's going to, when you drag things, it's going to change the text to fit. If I were to, if you double click that, you get this white mode. And here now the text is going to be changing um, size with the things. Um, if your text is part of something though, that is, if it's part of a group, then when you scale it, it will scale. Um, but if you were to just try to scale this like this, then it's going to, um, on its own, then it's going to cut off the text. Another thing is if you're in text, sometimes it can be like hard to, if you press escape, you get out of text. Um, and so, so not a lot of times you want to do like V to select something, but if you're in text and then you press V, well, now you're going to write a V in your text, but you can just press escape and get out. Another thing to be cautious of is like, sometimes there's control, there's, auto codes or whatever, like quick keys, hotkeys that you accidentally press, but you don't mean to. So command Y is going to basically show you everything, like the artboards kind of disappear, but you see all these lines. But it's good if you want to see like invisible things. So command Y. Command H is going to show or hide the edges. So here I press command H and now you can't see all the edges. If I press command H again, now you can. And so each of these points are points that you can click and drag. Speaking of points, um, you can do P to draw like a point and make a line um, or to add a new point onto a line and that sort of thing. So those are just some of the key, key things to know as well as this, um, over here, you have like your fill and your stroke, and you can change these, and you can also drag col um, colors and that sort of thing. Another thing is colors. So sometimes you might be inserting a graphic that was made in some sort of um, prism or graphpad, graphpad prism or some other software that's making figures, um, and then you're inserting them into your bigger figure. Sometimes those have really, really weird or really, really bright default colors and that sort of thing. And so you see there's a bunch of bright default colors here too on Illustrator. And some of these are just like obnoxiously bright, like this green and this red. What you, what's really helpful is so they have different, um, they have different color guides and libraries and stuff where you can have, they have various swaths um, that you can do. Um, if you find a, a color that you like, you can also then drag the color into here. And so it's like in your library. But if you have a various color, if you click on it, you can go to, and then you click on it down here, you can see a, basically it'll give you shades and tints and col colors that are like in the, that are good harmony rules or whatever. So basically um, good thing it's like that. And you can also adjust 
I like to do hue saturation and brightness um, to adjust these um, in order to get things that some, sometimes things are colors are too bright. Um, your text might not stand out or whatever. You can do change the saturation and the brightness and stuff without having to do transparency. If you, you also want to make sure that everything's like really consistent. And so if the text is different um, size or different scales, or you're, you're changing the size of something and then something else changes, this eyedropper tool is really helpful. Um, so, so just like V is a normal like select um, shin tool and it's going to select like the entire group or the entire object. If you do A, now you're in this, um, this direct select tool. And so now you can move individual items, even if they're part of a group, and you can move anchor points. Um, and so if I were to click on this and I say I wanted it to be in this type, I could then do I, which is the eyedropper, I can just click here, and then I can do it like this, and now it's formatted like that. And I can just control C if I want to remove that. Um, but those are some of the key things that features to use when you're doing like um, this sort of figure making, you just really need um, the basics. And then I have more in other posts. I'm not like an expert in an illustrator or whatever. I just know enough to get by. And I found that it's easier to get better over time um, when you practice. And yeah, so then if you go to window, there's a bunch of other um, you can see where you have like text and various things, um, stroke, so that you can then play around with these things. And really, it just takes some practice and getting used to, but it can be a really helpful tool um, to make these figures that you then have to go to whenever you are trying to remember what you did or you're trying to show somebody what you did. And yeah, so I hope this helps.